Good morning. Welcome to Parkside Church. We're so happy to have you here with us this Sunday morning. Um, if you'd like to stand, we're going to bring God um, some worship and praise.
Sundays. Today I get to introduce two mission topics. First is about the Mexico mission trip to Pastor Vasquez Church in San Luis, Mexico. After much prayer and many indicators, the team is postponed until spring break 2025. Now, <laughs> that is the Lord giving you time to pray about what part you're going to take in that mission trip. Okay, now I'm finished with my... Yeah. <laughs> Second, I have the privilege of introducing Rebecca Cornell and Josh Heimeller to update us on what YFC ministry is doing right here in Kern County. Woo! 
Well, it's always uh, great to be back here at Parkside Church. If we haven't met, my name is Josh, and um, yeah, it's just great to see so many uh, friends and um, to just reconnect with you, and more importantly, to, to update you on the partnership that you have with us uh, between Parkside Church and Youth for Christ. And I think the really unique thing about our partnership um, with Parkside Church is that you have two active and involved um, church members here who are actually on staff with us. We have Rebecca Cornell, who is our campus life director. She oversees all of our campus ministries programs. And um, this red hair behind the, the drum kit back here, um, he does more than play the drums. He, he came on um, as a part of our internship program this year. And um, both Rebecca and Casey uh, just do incredible ministry. They have um, a heart for Jesus. They have a heart for young people and for sharing the gospel with them. And I'm excited that they get to be a part of your church and be discipled here and be a part of this community. Um, it just, it's, just, it's just really great. And so, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to share with you a little bit about the needs that we are trying to meet through Youth for Christ here in our community. There's over 100,000 100, um, young people that are aged 11 and 19 here in Kern County. And um, our best estimates show that we're reaching about one-third of those through churches and other Christian organizations. So there's a huge gap um, that we're trying to help meet as the organization of Youth for Christ. And just to share kind of one um, practical need that we're really trying to help meet um, in recent years, I just I wrote down a few statistics here. Um, so over the last 10 years, researchers have found <clears throat> that feelings of loneliness among teenagers have increased by 74%. So 74% increase in feelings of loneliness among young people. And this is correlated with um, a similar increase in preventable deaths of dis despair. So things like suicide, drug overdose, alcohol abuse, and other diseases related to self-inflicted harm. And so there is just a huge need among young people for healthy positive relationships, and really just for sharing the hope and the love of Jesus. And that's what Rebecca is doing. That's what Casey's doing. That's what Youth for Christ um, is doing through our Campus Life program, where we go into school campuses, through Parent Life program, where we reach out to teenage mothers and fathers. We go into probation institutions through our juvenile justice ministry. We're reaching out to entire family units through our City Life program. And so um, you, as a church member here at Parkside Church, are a part of that. Um, as you give financially to your church and they support us through your mission board, um, as you give as just a member of the body of Christ directly to our programs, if you're a part of our prayer team, if you're part of our volunteer team, uh, like Kara Bauer and, and Pastor Taylor and uh, Jeannie McNutt, um, then you're a part of that. You're a part of helping us to share those healthy, positive relationships and that hope of Jesus um, with these teens who are struggling with uh, feelings of loneliness and despair. And so Becca's going to share just a couple of really um, personal stories of ways that your church has uh, partnered with us through Youth for Christ. Thanks, Josh. Um, just like Josh said earlier, I am so thankful to be here with you guys um, to share just your partnership with us, with the community, and the students we work with. Uh, last year when I was here, uh, when we were here, I shared the story of Genesis um, and just how she has gotten involved in Parkside. And so kind of just a follow-up, um, some of you have seen that she sometimes um, comes up here on Sunday morning and shares scripture with us. Um, she comes uh, again on Wednesday nights, Sundays. Um, but what you might not know, she actually also helps up in the media with Wes running slides. Um, once or twice a month or whenever Wes needs her. Um, and something that's also really cool is that as Genesis has gotten involved, she's also brought some friends with her, uh, Miley and Michelle, and you might have also seen them. And they also help her sometimes running slides, which is really cool. And I think something that's just really beautiful about Genesis' story is that as she's now like almost like two years coming to Parkside, that as she's gotten involved in different ministries, Parkside has become like her church home. Like it's become the place where she belongs and she feels known, which is really cool to take a girl who knew nothing about God, who, who didn't have a relationship, and seeing her like fast forward two years, um, just seeing everything that God's done in her life. And so I also want to share one more story with you. Um, 
We've brought some new kids this year to Parkside, um, and one student is uh, by the name of Angel, and he's a sophomore at Monte High School. And uh, Angel's story is really cool because he started coming last year when he was a freshman, um, but this year through Casey um, and his mentorship, he's really kind of gotten to know Angel. And as he's gotten to know Angel, we've found out that Angel doesn't have a relationship with God. He currently is just still searching, finding, kind of needing to find more information. But what's so cool about Angel's story is that even though he doesn't have a relationship with God, he has this great desire to come on Wednesday nights to youth group. And I think to me, and hopefully you all see, just the awe and the power of God to take a student who, it's not that he doesn't have anything to do with God, but that he doesn't know anything about God, and comes to a place where we teach about God every single week. And he wants to keep coming, like he wants to come to everything. And I think that really just shows God's faithfulness and love um, for his children. And so um, I don't know where Angel's story is going to go. I don't know how it's going to end. Um, but I know God is faithful and he's going to continue to use Parkside, continue to use the youth group um, to reach Angel. And I just want to say one last thing. Uh, I'd stop talking. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you uh, to Kara. Um, I don't think you guys know how much um, she gives to Parkside with the youth group. She gives her sweat, her tears, her energy. She just has a desire to reach uh, the students, not just at Parkside, but to reach the lost students in our community, the students that Josh talked about that are that are suffering, that just need help and are crying out for help. And Kara and her team with Alyssa and Daniel and JC and Pastor Taylor um, and Mike every week just coming faithfully and meeting those needs. Um, I'm just so forever grateful um, because I've never brought a student here who's never left telling me that this felt like family. So, so thankful for that. I, I heard rumors that you also sacrificed your body sometimes for youth ministry. I don't, I, there's a connection with Youth for Christ with that, but I'm not exactly sure, so. Thank you, guys. Uh, you know, I, I love all the, the ministries that we support here at Parkside, but I think I would be lying if I didn't say there's a special place in my heart for, for YFC. The amount of, uh, just the number of, of students, like, like Josh and, and Becca said, unreached students coming to, to church through YFC has been awesome. And you guys don't know this, but it is a fairly regular thing that mid-sermon, Miley, Michelle, and Genesis are standing up there waving to me, trying to distract me and get my attention. <laughs> Which is fantastic. So would you join me as we, uh, we pray uh, for, for Youth for Christ? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we are just overwhelmed by the, by the work you are doing, by the, by the love you have and, and the desire you have to, for the world to know your good news, to hear the, the message of hope and the message of, of mercy, the message of wholeness that your son brings and, and how we can, we can know you through his sacrifice on the cross. Lord, I thank you for the, for the work that you do through Youth for Christ. I pray that, Lord, that, that you, would, you would encourage and strengthen not just Josh and, and Becca, but, but every, every member of, of Youth for Christ, uh, from, from leadership to, to volunteers and everywhere in between, Lord. Would we be a people joined together to reach the world with the good news of your gospel? God, we, we just offer you this time. We ask that you would you'd fill us with your spirit. Uh, lift our, our, our voices and our, our praises and our worship to you. Would you be made much of during this time? We thank you, Father. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Thanks, guys. One, one quick announcement before I invite the ushers to come forward, and that is just that if you are, are new or visiting the Parkside, we want to extend a special welcome to you and thank you for being here. We also have a, a newcomer's luncheon after the service today, and some of you signed up for it. That's great. Come. If you didn't sign up and you just want a free lunch, come anyway. We have, what, we have plenty of food. It's a great opportunity to, to hang out, get to know a little bit more about our church. So if you're, if you're new or even you know, semi-new, we would love to, to see you there. I'd like to invite the ushers now to come forward and receive our tithes and offerings, and I will dismiss all the children to, to kids' time in the back with Miss Brianna.
So from heaven you came run, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Praise the
remain standing for the reading of God's word. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. After this, a Jewish festival took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. By the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethsaida in Aramaic, which has five colonnades. Within these lay a large number of the disabled, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who'd been disabled for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and realized he had already been there for a long time, he said to him, do you want to get well? Sir, the, the um, disabled man answered, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred. But while I'm coming, someone gets there ahead of me. Get up, Jesus told him. Pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man got well, picked up his mat, and started to walk. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Good morning again. About, about two weeks ago, I got, I got a cold. Nothing too terrible, but enough to, to leave me feeling a little bit under the weather for, for a couple of days. However, in typical male fashion, I decided to milk this for all it was worth. <laughs> I needed my wife and daughters to know just how badly I was feeling. Specifically, I needed them to know they had no idea how badly I was feeling. Now, I know most of the ladies in here are probably going, great, here's yet another example of a man overreacting to a minor cold. But did you know, guys, you're going to thank me for this in a moment, that a 2017 study cited by Harvard Health Publishing found that man flu may actually be a real thing. <laughs> That's right, the common cold may in fact be worse for men than women. Now, <laughs> sorry, this is, sort of, this is sort of hard to say with a straight face. Um, but we obviously don't have time to go into the weeds of, of this study, and I would prefer if you don't fact check me on this. But some of the results suggested that the immune response in women to the flu is slightly less than it is in men. And since flu symptoms are in large part due to the body's immune response, then a lessened immune response in women may actually translate to milder symptoms. So there you have it. It's science, people. It's real. <laughs> but all kidding aside, study or no study, I'll admit it, I'm a bit of a wimp when it comes to getting sick. I, I hate not feeling 100%. And no matter what my gracious wife would say, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty positive she has internally rolled her eyes once or twice as I suffered through a, a minor cold. But whatever may have crossed her mind and whatever she may have thought, I'm very appreciative that she has never asked me the question Jesus asks in our passage this morning. That is, she has never come up to me while I'm sick and said, Taylor, do you want to get well? Do you really want to get well? Now this is, of course, a question we just heard Jesus ask in John 5, 6 to a man who'd been crippled for 38 years. And I say I'm glad my wife has never asked me this question because truth be told, I have a hard time imagining I would respond very positively to it, right? I mean, if I were, if I were truly sick, how dare you ask me if I want to get well? Of course I want to get well. Isn't this, isn't this question have sort of a, a foregone conclusion? <clears throat> Truth be told, I think I'd probably be pretty offended if anyone asked me that question while I was sick. And yet, it's precisely the question Jesus asks in our passage this morning. Now, as many of you know, today marks the, the second week in our series examining the, the questions of Jesus, studying just, just a handful of the, the literally hundreds of questions Jesus asked throughout the Gospels. And, and this morning we come to a question which for me, for me personally is, is among the most perplexing of all the questions 
Jesus asks. Largely for the reason we just acknowledged, that the answer appears, it appears to have such, such an obvious answer. What, what really is the point of asking a man who's been crippled for nearly four decades if he wants to get well? Shouldn't the answer be a, a resounding yes? But believe it or not, this is not the only time or the only place in Scripture we see Jesus ask a question like this. In fact, throughout his, his ministry, we see Jesus repeatedly asking people what they want him to do for him or what, what they want from him. In Matthew chapter 20, for example, we find two blind men sitting on the road as, as Jesus and his disciples walk by. And the, the blind men begin to shout at Jesus, son of, son of David, have mercy on us, only to have Jesus stop and say, what do you want me to do for you? Which again is a question that seems to have kind of an obvious answer, doesn't it? So all of this leads me to wonder, why does Jesus ask, do you want to be well? What's Jesus driving at when he asks this question? Is he just being rude or is he revealing something significant about the nature of healing? And when we think about it, this is a really important question for each of us to answer. Because at least to some degree, all of us come to Jesus for healing. All of us come to Jesus seeking something. Maybe it's healing from our, something in our past. Maybe it's healing from something in our, in our present. But whatever the case may be, all of us come to Jesus for something. And yet in Scripture, we see Jesus repeatedly ask some version of this do you want to be well question. Meaning it's quite likely that Jesus, not only what he asked the, the crippled man in our passage, he might also ask you and I as well. So if you have a Bible with you this morning, I want to invite you to turn to John chapter 5 as we consider the story of this crippled man and the strange question Jesus asked him. Now as we come to John chapter 5, we need to sort of set the stage for the conversation Jesus is about to have. Because not only does Jesus ask a strange question in these verses, but really the setting of this conversation is also sort of a, a, an interesting one. And, and the passage itself is, is a bit unusual. So John introduces us to this setting in, in verse 1 of chapter 5, where he writes, After this, a Jewish festival took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. By the sheep gate in Jerusalem, there was a pool called Bethesda in Aramaic, which has five colonnades. Within these lay a large number of the disabled, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been disabled for 38 years. Let's we'll stop there for a second. What we see in these first four verses is John sort of lay the setting for this conversation between Jesus and this crippled man. And what John describes is a, is a pool with five distinct colonnades near the outer wall of Jerusalem. John also tells us that gathered around this pool is a large number of hurting and sick people. People who are, who are lame, people who are, who are paralyzed, people who are, who are crippled. One of which is a man who has been crippled for 38 long years. Interestingly though, what John does not say is why there are so many sick people gathered at this pool in the first place. And if this seems like sort of an odd detail to leave out, you actually aren't the only one. In fact, if you have a Bible with you this morning, you have one from the pew in the back of, of the, the pew in front of you, you will notice that in the, verse, in the passage we just read, there is no verse 4. That's right. The passage goes from verse 3 straight to verse 5. And this is true in almost every major English translation. The significant uh, exceptions being the, the King James Version and the New King James Version. Both of those will print verse 4 in the text of the Bible, while the rest of most other major translations, like mine, will print it down here in the footnote of your Bible. And the reason for this is simply because none of the very earliest manuscripts of John have this verse, have verse 4 present in them. Every single one of the, the earliest manuscripts we have of the Gospel of John do not contain verse 4. Rather, verse 4 only begins to appear in ancient manuscripts that are dated a few hundred years after the Gospel of John was originally written. And what this means, this has led many scholars to believe that, that verse 4 was sort of maybe an explanatory note that was filled in in the margin of the Gospel that over time sort of worked its way into the text itself and has subsequently been removed. 
Now, in case you're curious, or in case your Bible, for some reason, does not have verse 4 in the footnote, this is what verse 4 says. From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool, after each such disturbance, would be cured of whatever disease they had. And I think to some degree, when we read this, it's sort of, you can understand why this maybe got added in the margin, because it gives us a little bit of context for why this place was what it was, why, why all these ailing people are gathered around the pool to begin with, namely because they're seeking healing. But it might also prompt us to ask, what is going on here? Why, why, is, why did this place become a place associated with healing, and, and what is going on when this, when this water is stirred, is being stirred up? Well, interestingly enough, archaeologists actually discovered this pool right where John said it was in the late 19th century. And they found it, like I said, exactly where John said it was, exactly with the same five colonnades John, John described. Uh, and in fact, I think we have a picture of it. There we go. This is what the site actually looks like today. But perhaps most significantly, during this excavation, archaeologists found that the, the large pool that was once here and has since dried up was actually spring-fed, meaning that, that through periodically the, the, the spring would sort of fill up the pool and, the, and it would cause the water in the pool to bubble and stir for apparently no, no, no reason whatsoever. So <clears throat> thus it appears that there was kind of a, a common misconception or a common belief in, in first century Israel at this time that the freshly stirred water in the pool could heal illnesses. Now we should be careful to note though that John, the author of the gospel that we're, that we're reading, there's no indication that this is what he believed. Rather, this is just what the crowd or, the, or the, a number of people in first century Jerusalem believed. Get into the pool of Bethesda after it has been stirred and you will be healed with one very significant catch, one stipulation placed on the healing this pool could offer. And we see it in the crippled man's response to Jesus' strange question. In verses 6 and 7, we read, When Jesus saw him lying there and realized he had been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But when I am going, someone goes down ahead of me. Now for me, this is where, for me personally, this is where the story really starts to get interesting because there's a few details here that I think we could very easily miss if we don't take time to stop and notice. Notice first that John says Jesus realized, Jesus knew that this man had been there for a long time. Now, we aren't, we aren't sure exactly how many years this man has been by the pool itself, but we know he's been crippled for 38. Almost four decades of being unable to walk. Longer than I've been alive, actually. But even more significantly, notice how in the man's response to Jesus, in the man's response to Jesus, he doesn't actually answer Jesus' question. He doesn't, does he? The very question which is the topic of our conversation this morning, the very, the very question which seemingly has such an obvious answer, do you want to be well, doesn't actually get answered. Which is kind of mind-boggling if you think about it, because the more we understand about this, this pool, the more we understand about why people were gathered here, the more we come to realize that the whole point of being at this pool was to find healing, right? Right? I mean, that's the only reason you were, you were here. That's, that's what brought all these people to this location. In other words, this is something like going to the emergency room, finding someone who's been there for 38 years, only a slight exaggeration in some cases, <laughs> asking them if they want to be well, and then not getting a straight answer, which is kind of, which is kind of crazy. But it's exactly what we see in this passage. Jesus says, do you want to be well? And the man sidesteps the question. He doesn't offer any version of yes. None whatsoever. What does he do? Instead, he responds with, a, with an excuse about why healing isn't possible for him. He responds with the reason why he 
can't find healing. Which in his case is because whenever the the water in the pool is stirred, he has no one to get him down to the pool fast enough. Someone always beats him there. And I think all this background should sort of do something to us as we we think about what this pool was was there for, what they believed it was there for, and and what this man says to Jesus' question. It should start to make us see Jesus' question through new, new eyes. Should help us begin to see how the question, do you want to be well, actually does reveal something significant about the nature of healing. Something which, if left unrecognized, can actually keep us from the healing we're hoping to find. Because there are truths here in this passage that unless you and I come to grips with them, the healing of Jesus will always elude us. So what is this question, do you want to be well, teach us about healing? Well, two things I believe. The first of which is the often overlooked truth that healing requires a change. Healing requires a change. This is something we we rarely acknowledge, but it's absolutely necessary for us to realize. Because we, we read this question, do you want to be well? And at first glance, like we said earlier, it almost comes off a little bit offensive, right? Like, how dare you ask me if I want to be well? But what this response fails to recognize is that some of us are actually more comfortable being sick. Some of us grow to prefer familiar pain over unfamiliar healing. And I know this is difficult to admit, but it's it's true because as humans, we get comfortable with what we know. We get comfortable with what is familiar. All of us do it. You do it. I do it. All of us do it. And oftentimes, change, even for the better, tends to scare us. A really easy example of this from my own life comes from the first five or six years my my wife and I were, were married, when almost every year it seemed like our living situation changed. Every 12 to 18 months, it felt like we were moving. And guess what? Every move was an improvement. Every move was a step to a slightly better living situation. We went from a a one-bedroom apartment to a a two-bedroom apartment, same apartment complex, just right across the the way. And a little bit after that, we went to a a guest home on the the property of of one of the the families in the church. Every single move was a step up, was was an upgrade. But you want to know something? In every single case... I didn't want to go. It's true. My wife, my wife will tell you, in every case, even though it was an obvious upgrade, even though I could look across and go, yep, that would be better, I kind of wanted to stay put because it was easier. It was familiar. I, I, I kind of knew where I was. And change is, is scary. So even when the change was for the better, I never wanted any part of it. But this is a This is a major problem because the healing Jesus offers us always includes change. Jesus will never heal us and then leave us where we're at. To do so would be utterly contrary to his his mission. Because what is God's purpose for us in Christ? Paul tells us in Colossians, He, that's the Father, has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. Which means you and I were living in darkness until Jesus showed up and said, pack your bags, we're moving. Actually, more realistically, He probably said, leave your stuff, we're we're moving. But the reality is, this isn't always something we want, is it? Sometimes we don't want change, even if it means healing. Jesus himself says this is, the, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and the people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. In other words, we got comfortable in our own brokenness. We got comfortable in, in our own sin. But the healing Jesus offers 
requires a change. And we see this very clearly in the life of the man at the pool of Bethesda who spent 38 years being unable to walk until one day Jesus said to him, get up, Jesus told him. Pick up your mat and walk. 38 years and then boom, all of a sudden he can walk again. That's a pretty significant lifestyle change if you think about it. One, I'm confident this man had utterly given up hope of ever making because brokenness was all he had known for as long as he could remember. But I have to wonder if this isn't sometimes also the case for us. Because let me ask you sort of a, a personal question, if I may. What's your affliction this morning? What, what deep brokenness defines you? Maybe like the man in the story, it's, it's a physical affliction. It's a, it's a difficult diagnosis. Or maybe, maybe it's something that in some ways is actually a lot deeper. Maybe it's an addiction you, you can't seem to escape. Maybe it's some habitual sin that no matter what you try, you just you cannot get out of. Maybe it's shame and guilt for who you once were. Maybe it's doubt that God has forgiven you and accepted you. Maybe it's the pain of loss and failure. But whatever the case may be, let me ask you a slightly tougher follow-up question. Have you begun to give up hope? Have you, begun, have you begun to believe this is the brokenness that will define you and be the reality of your, your life? That this is all you will ever be. In other words, have, have we become so comfortable in our brokenness that when Jesus shows up and says, do you want to be well, are the first things that pop into our minds reasons why it can't happen. Reasons why we aren't going to be able to experience that healing or why we can't be whole. Because if this is the case, if that's the case, then I have to be the bearer of some difficult news. The news that that Jesus doesn't care about any of those excuses. I'm sorry, but he, he doesn't. Because he's here to offer you healing. And healing requires a change. Even when it's uncomfortable. The second thing this, this question teaches us about healing is that healing requires a cure. Not only does healing require a change, but healing also requires a cure and in the case of the crippled man at the at the pool of Bethesda it was not the cure he expected or looked for was it it was not how he thought healing would would come instead after spending years wasted on superstitious earthly hope of healing Jesus has the power to cure him in an instant but ironically what was an unexpected cure for the man in our story was an unwanted cure for some people in the crowd that day. John shockingly tells us this in the following verses where he writes, Instantly, the man got well, picked up his mat, and started to walk. Now that day was the Sabbath, and so the Jews said to the man who'd been healed, This is the Sabbath. The law prohibits you from picking up your mat. I'm sorry, can you imagine that? for a second someone's been healed or someone's been crippled for 38 years and there are some people in the crowd who are actually upset he gets healed because it violates their their religious traditions and crazily enough shockingly enough a few verses later John tells us this is why the religious leaders were trying to kill Jesus this is why because the healing he brought didn't fit their man-made religion. And I think this is a jarring reminder for us that though we all seek healing, we don't always like the cure. We don't always like the cure. And I think the reason for this is because in the words of, of theologian and pastor John Stott, the cure of Jesus has certain implications. The cure of Jesus has certain implications. In other words, it means something for you and I. 
Because turning to Jesus means recognizing we are not going to find a cure on our own. It means understanding that the sickness we face is deeper than what we can deal with. Deeper than what any earthly remedies we're so hung up on are going to be able to cure. And yet oftentimes like a child who doesn't like being sick but also really doesn't like the taste of their own medicine, we would rather do anything than, than accept the thing that will save us. In many ways, we're like the, the Old Testament character Naaman. Naaman, who after being struck with a, with a deadly, deadly skin disease, goes to desperately seeks out every, every doctor he can find, tries every treatment plan they come up with. Everything they suggest, he tries. Trying anything to save his life. All to no avail. And yet finally, when there's very little hope left, Naaman hears of a doctor he's not yet visited. A faraway healer in the land of Israel rumored to possess great power. So in desperation, Naaman travels all the way to Israel, hoping against hope to find a cure. But when he finally arrives at the healer's home, the meeting goes nothing like he thinks it will. Instead, the healer won't even come out to see him, sends a servant to to discuss Naaman's, Naaman's illness and, and converses through the servant. Then prescribes the most unusual treatment. Go to the, to the muddy water, the muddy river down the, down the road. Bathe in it and you will be healed. Scripture tells us of Naaman's response. But Naaman got angry and left saying, I was telling myself, surely he will come out. Stand and call on the name of his God. Wave his hand over the place and cure the skin disease. Art Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. Couldn't I wash in them and be clean? So he turned and left in a rage. I can't help but think that both the reaction of Naaman in 2 Kings 5 and the reaction of the, the religious leaders here in in John 5, should be a powerful warning to us. A warning that though we all seek healing, we also all have some pretty specific ideas about what that healing should look like, don't we? We have some pretty, pretty concrete ideas about what the healing will look like when it comes. It'll be a new spouse. It'll be a new, a new career. A new president. A better diagnosis. Better church, maybe. It'll be when life happens exactly how we want it to happen. And yet, Jesus' strange question wrecks all that. Do you want to be well? He asks. Do you want to be well? Leaving us to ponder do we really? Do we want it enough to change? Enough to give up that sin we enjoy so much once and for all? Enough to make God's Word the supreme authority in our life? Enough to trust Him with the future? Enough to say, God, I know you, you tell me not to be anxious. Okay, I trust you. Enough to lay down our own expectations of what the cure will look like. Enough to follow Jesus even when it costs us. Do we really want to be well? Because if so, then just like the crippled man in the story, Jesus offers us a cure. Jesus offers us a cure. Faith in him, trust in his sacrifice, and acceptance of him as Lord and Savior. And if we're willing to make that change and accept His blood as the cure, then make no mistake, we will experience healing. But only then. And only when we come to grips with what His healing requires. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Almighty, gracious Heavenly Father,
we come before you, we confess that we are broken. We are sick. We are in desperate need of healing. And yet even so, we are so convinced we know what healing looks like We know what the cure will be. Lord, forgive us for all the places we have looked before turning to you. Father, I ask now that you would stir our hearts with your spirit. Give us eyes to see the healing your son offers. Give us a heart to desire it. Ears to hear it because we are desperately broken. But in Jesus, we can find healing. So Lord, would you heal us? Would we accept your cure? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us as we offer one last song of worship?
Amen. Amen. If, if you are by chance joining us for lunch, just to let you know we're meeting in rooms one and two, which is right out these center doors across the courtyard in the, in the building on the other side of the, of the lawn. Now would you join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.